Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to talk about connection balancing or load balancing. And that's basically going to be a discussion about how to run your applications in a distributed environment. That is, you have an application, you have a web application, for example, you want to run it on more than just one single server because that single server might fail or that single server might just not be enough to be able to support so many connections from all your customers. So you might want to run that application into a so-called server farm. That is multiple servers configured almost identically that are running the same application. Now, since you have multiple servers, have multiple endpoints that are able to serve your application, you also need a, some sort of a device to put in front of those servers that receives all the connections from your clients. For example, a device that responds to the DNS name of your website, and then in turn is gonna take care of distributing those connections among those multiple servers that you have in your server farm. That device is what we're calling a load balancer. And we're going to mention also a couple of attacks designed to bring down such an infrastructure, especially when it comes to web applications. So first of all, let's try defining a load balancer. As we just said, it's, it's a device. It can be hardware, it can be software device that receives all the connections from your clients and then decides to which server it's going to redirect those connections. So here's a very small diagram here from the Nginx website. We can see the clients or the end users on the left hand side connecting over the internet, reaching out to a software load balancer or a hardware load balancer. Basically, it's going to be the, pretty much the same solution as in it's going to be some sort of a software solution that receives those connections and acts on like some sort of a proxy. It could be just a software running on a virtual machine. It could be software running on some infrastructure in some cloud, which basically it's still going to be a virtual machine, or it can be a dedicated box, physical box that's that's living somewhere inside of your data center right in front of your servers. And of course, behind that box or behind that software solution, we're gonna find the application servers. Now, of course, the load balancers need to be aware of the servers uh, behind them in order to periodically check whether those servers are still responding, they're still able to uh, deliver the service that we're announcing, as in our website, our web application, but that's the business of the load balancer. All the clients need to know is which internet address, which domain name, which website address they need to use in order to reach the endpoint, the listener endpoint on this load balancer, the internet facing endpoint of the load balancer. Another great benefit of load balancers is the ability to provide fault tolerance. So at some point, a server might fail. Once one of those servers in that server farm, maybe the power source fails, maybe a hard drive or an SSD fails. Well, the load balancer would better detect this before the end customers would actually continue attempting to connect to that dead server. So the load balancer should perform some sort of a health check. And if that server is not responding anymore, it's going to temporarily remove it from the server pool and stop directing connections to it. In an ideal scenario, your clients would not even feel the fact that their, their server that they've been connecting to so far has suddenly died and all their connections are suddenly moved to a different server in the same server pool. Next, we could have resilience against attacks. And I said we could have because the load balancer in itself is not considered by definition to be a security device. It can be and most load balancing solutions nowadays do have some security built in. But if you just think about the fact that the load balancer is the single point of connection through which all the connections go in order to reach your actual uh, servers that are hosting your applications, well, that would be a great point in the network to perform some sort of security filtering. How about uh, we look at the traffic, we look at the requests coming in from from the clients and see if something's fishy in there let's see maybe we can detect uh denial of service attacks maybe somebody's trying to flood our website or even uh, even uh, going higher up to layer seven at the application layer if we are able to look at the actual http requests coming in we might be able to detect things uh, such as cross-site scripting or sql injection attacks but that depends on how complex the solution is, the load balancing solution, how able it is, and of course, how it was actually configured. Just remember that by default, the load balancer is not a security solution in itself. Even though, even without any security policy implemented in it, it's still one extra hop between a potential attacker and the server, the web server to be compromised. So you might ask, how does a load balancer actually make those decisions? How does it decide 
where to send those connections, which server to choose. I have 10 servers in my server farm. There's a request coming in. Where do I send it? Where well, there are a number of algorithms that help them decide which server to use. But we also have to start from what exactly is being taken into consideration before making that decision. So what does the load balancer look at? And the simplest implementation here would be for a load balancer to simply look at the layer three and layer four headers. That is a source destination IP address, destination port, and that's pretty much it, All right? So we could be balancing connections simply by looking at the fact that we are receiving a, an HTTP or an HTTPS connection going to a specific application. And we know that we're listening for that specific application on the HTTPS port. And if a connection comes in, then we can simply direct it to one of the servers in the backend. Now, of course, since we're talking about layer four, we should mention that we can make decisions based on UDP ports as well. So if it's a UDP application and we're going to receive UDP requests, uh, we're going to treat them completely the same. So if it's a UDP application listening for requests, we could just direct those requests based on a UDP destination port, for example. Now, if we have a load balancer that is able to look at layer seven, that means it has to unwrap those requests coming in from the clients and actually understand what the client is trying to do. So it can drill down to uh, some very specific and granular piece of information, such as the entire URL being requested or the type of traffic being requested. That is, let's say, for example, we could direct those connections in a different manner, depending on the actual URL or the website or the application that the client is requesting, even though perhaps all the servers in the back end are running the same apps, right? But since we don't want to overload with a single server, we could just choose a couple of servers that serve application A, another couple of servers that serve application B and so on. Another method for balancing at layer seven is deciding what type of content the client is requesting. So we might choose to direct those requests to a regular server uh, for, I don't know, maybe HTML page requests, maybe CSS requests, maybe JavaScript requests, things that are, let's say, not so resource intensive to be, uh, to be delivered. But for example, if we see a request coming in that requests a streaming video, we might want to direct that request to a server with a lot more CPU processing power, more RAM, and perhaps even more networking bandwidth that is able to process, to keep processing that continuous stream of video data. And since we briefly mentioned, how does the load balancer actually choose a server? Well, it could do it just randomly. That's one of the methods that can be used inside of a load balancer, but this is not going to take into consideration the load of the servers, perhaps. By just choosing a server at random, we might end up with overloaded servers while others are completely unused. So a better solution would be to take into consideration the load of the servers themselves. This requires the load balancer to keep track of how many requests have been sent to each server and perhaps even query those servers from time to time as to their CPU usage, how many active connections they have, and so on. Another method, another very simple to implement method is called round robin. That is just pick one server at a time for each request that comes in. Send the first request to server one, second one, server two, third one, server three, and then come back again and cycle through all those servers for as many connections as we need to send. Now, this might sound like good load balancing, but you should remember that not all requests are born equal. That is, one request might take the server 10 milliseconds to process and to generate a response for it. Another request might take the server 10 or 20 seconds if, if it needs to access some uh, authentication third-party authentication services. Maybe it needs to query a database. Maybe the database is busy, right? <laughs> Maybe the response coming in from the database needs to be processed by the web application code. And that takes a lot more effort. Don't assume that every request is going to be processed in the same amount of time. That's why a, a weighted distribution, and especially a distribution that takes into consideration the load on each server, is the best distribution preferred in order to achieve better resource utilization in your server farm. And finally, one thing to mention here is session persistence. Remember, if you're connecting to a to an application to a website, right? You're logging into your email account, let's say, on a on a browser. Uh, then all subsequent requests are going to suddenly become authenticated. That's because you have generated some sort of a session information that is being attached to all your uh, subsequent requests. So all that session information between you and the server is stored on a single server on that backend behind the load balancer. So once you've authenticated and you've generated that 
um, that session information, that session information is going to be stored on a single server, which means that all your subsequent requests should end up to the same server. Because if they don't end up to the same server, another server is not going to recognize you. It's going to say, I don't know who you are. You're not authenticated. I'm not going to deliver that content to you. So the load balancer also needs to be aware of the fact that some clients, when they initiate a session, they have to stick with it. <laughs> Once they've chosen a specific server in the backend to initiate a session with, all the subsequent connections coming from the same, uh, same client using the same session information should end up reaching that same server because that's the only server that has that session information and is able to further serve those clients. So session persistence is something that has to be supported by load balancer as well. In most situations, this type of session persistence is ensured by using uh, HTTP cookies in your requests. And of course, the load balancer has to look for those cookies and identify them as valid active sessions. So in talking about attacks that are aimed at denying the availability of a specific resource, we call these attacks denial of service. Now, denial of service attack is simply is, is most likely the simplest type of attack, and it's also a, uh, a very dangerous one. Its only purpose is not to steal information, it's not to corrupt information, it's not to compromise data, it's, it's not aimed for a data breach, although it can be used as a tool that leads to something like this, but its purpose is to simply deny access to some sort of a network resource. How do you do this? Well, you overwhelm that resource or any of the devices that lead to it with so many connections, active connections, uh, or you're trying to oversaturate the, the link bandwidth with so much bogus traffic, fake traffic, or you're trying to consume all the CPU power or all the memory or any other resource involved in serving those or ensuring access to those resources so that the legitimate users cannot reach them anymore. So basically you're creating so much noise, so much useless network traffic, uh, requests or CPU usage noise so that regular users are denied access to those resources. The bad news about a denial of service attack is the fact that it is extremely easy to conduct. There are a lot of tools out there, free tools on, on the internet, where you just have to enter an IP address or a web address and you press a button and it suddenly starts opening tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of connections to that single website in an attempt to bring it down. Now, in most situations, those connections actually don't look like regular connections initiated from a regular browser. Then it'll be half open connections. That is, we're initiating a connection and then we're not fulfilling the entire uh, three-way handshake over TCP or we're not uh, responding with a valid HTTP code or we're not continuing the communication so that we can keep that connection open on the server, on the victim server, and thus by opening more and more connections, half open connections like these, we're gonna exhaust its resources. And what's even worse is the fact that a really efficient denial of service attack is launched from multiple sources at the same time. Uh, your computer, your laptop might not be enough to bring down the server that is hosting an application and was designed perhaps to support, let's say, a thousand simultaneous connections. But what if you have a thousand computers? Well, if you have a thousand computers under your control, and you are the attacker, then that network of compromised computers is called a botnet. And the reason for a botnet is that whenever you're launching an application, especially denial of service application from botnet, your power is huge. <laughs> the, the volume of traffic that you can generate, uh, the amount of connections that you can initiate every second are most likely going to bring down any victim that you choose over the internet, any website hosted on any type of server. And whenever you hear of uh, denial of service attacks or flooding against websites, the most common type of flooding is called a SYN flood. You know, the, uh, the three-way handshake in TCP, you send a SYN, you await for a SYN ACK to come back from the server, and then you respond with an ACK. So those are the three messages that make up the three-way handshake. Well, what if you send a SYN? The server replies back with a SYN ACK, but you don't reply with an ACK back again. Well, that's a connection that is now half open. And in pretty much any situation, every resource on this earth is, is going to be limited. Uh, 
and the capacity of a server to maintain a number of half open connection is also going to be limited. So at some point, if you open just enough, uh, a sufficient number of connections and you leave them in this half open state, the server is going to fill up its state table and it's not going to be able to respond to valid requests coming in from valid clients. Even more, you can combine this approach with a spoofed IP address. That is, uh, you're not only sending the SIN and you're not sending the, the final hack, but you're even sending the SIN with a fake IP address. So the server response doesn't come back to you because you don't want to flood yourself, right? <laughs> but the server response comes back to some random IP address over the internet, uh, an address that has no intention of <laughs> completing that half open connection, of course. Also, in a, another interesting approach in denial of service attacks is an amplification attack. It's most likely also going to be distributed as well. So we're going to talk about amplification DDoS attacks. And an amplification attack refers to the way certain protocols were designed and certain protocols was des were designed uh, so that they act on a request reply pattern, which is completely typical. Uh, but in some situations, those protocols have a disproportionate ratio between the request, which can be very, very small, and the reply, which can be huge. A couple of uh, protocols are quote unquote vulnerable because it's not exactly a vulnerability. It's more like a just a, a design feature of that protocol. And among those two are NTP and DNS. For DNS, you probably know that a DNS request in itself is very small, but the response that you receive from the server, especially if the server has a, has a large database and it's able to list a bunch of uh, A records or name, name server records or mail exchange records, well, the response can be much, much larger than a request. Similarly with NTP, you might not expect this, but NTP, the network time protocol, the protocol that we're using to synchronize time over the internet, uh, can, also, uh, can also support specific requests that make the server reply with the list of the last 600 IP addresses that the NTP server has contacted. Again, we're talking about pretty old protocols designed in an, uh, in an age where security wasn't the first concern. Nowadays, we can leverage this behavior to create distributed, amplified denial of service attacks. Of course, by spoofing IP addresses. And what I mean by spoofing them is this time we're not spoofing the IP address with a random address like we did with the SIN flood, but now we're spoofing them with the victim's address. So we're contacting a bunch of DNS or NTP servers all over the internet because they're pretty much free, right? They don't have any kind of security built in. And then we convince them all to reply at the same time to a single IP address, overwhelming that IP address with a huge amount of traffic. And you don't even need a botnet to do this. You're basically relying on the internet infrastructure that's made up of NTP and DNS servers out there, free to use for everyone, but you start using them as tools for your attack. Now that's kind of scary, right? <laughs> now let's just talk for a minute. How can we possibly mitigate denial of server, distributed denial of servers attack? Now we could be doing it at our own load balancing level inside of our load balancer, uh, which perhaps is installed in a clustered topology. And I'm going to talk about this on the next slide. A better solution would have to be involved with the ISP, the internet service provider, and have them the ISP filter that bogus traffic before it even reaches us. And if you think about it, that's the best solution because the ISP's network has a lot more capacity than whatever network capacity you might have in on your own, uh, your own internet connection. And secondly, the ISP is able to see that traffic before it even reaches you. Because if you're thinking about, well, I'll just identify the traffic that belongs to a denial of service and I'll just simply drop it on my firewall or on my router or on my load balancer. Yes, you might, you might do this, but well, think about it. What if all the traffic that reaches you is denial of service traffic? What if you're not even seeing, you're not even receiving any valid requests because the denial of service has filled up your entire bandwidth has consumed your entire internet connection, the capacity of your connection, and all you're seeing is denial of service traffic. You might drop that traffic, but you're left with nothing. You're still not receiving valid cli client connections. So a better solution would be to have the ISP drop that traffic before it even reaches you. 
another um, problem with uh, doing your own filtering inside of your, your own backyard is, well, what if that denial of service traffic is aimed at eating up all your processing power or CPU resources? If your internet facing router has its CPU at 100%, it's probably not even going to be able to respond to an admin command when you're trying to connect to it and you're trying to build an access list perhaps and, and, and match that traffic in order to drop it. Your router might be so overwhelmed that you might not even be able to interact with it. So another reason why ISP involvement uh, is a great solution here. Now, of course, this is going to have a cost. And it's going to have a cost as in uh, many ISPs allow you to simply buy the solution from themselves. Or you could have a solution where you have, a, let's say, a load balancer in your own network. And you also have a piece of hardware or a virtual machine installed in the ISP's network. And the moment you identify traffic coming in as being part of a denial of service attack, you, you signal the, your, your device counterpart from the ISP's network, and that's when traffic filtering starts to happen. So you're identifying the traffic, and then you're communicating with another device that belongs to you, but it's hosted in the ISP's network. So you're basically filtering your own traffic, it's just that you're doing before it reaches you, before it reaches your network. Now, of course, this solution also has a pretty big cost. And finally, the third method here on the slide, uh, black hole and sinkhole routing. Well, black hole routing is basically what we just said. When you're building an access list, you're matching that specific uh, denial of service traffic. Sometimes you're not even be able to match it because it uses spoofed IP addresses. But let's assume that you're able to match that traffic and you simply redirect it to null, to the null zero interface, to uh, dev null, to the bit bucket, right? You drop the traffic so it doesn't reach any other interface. It's not being routed. It's not reaching your servers. You're just dropping the traffic. Now, of course, the, the problem that we mentioned uh, still stands. What if your entire traffic is denial of service and you're basically dropping all the traffic and you're left with nothing? We're talking here about, let's say, situations where uh, denial of service traffic doesn't saturate your, uh, your internet connection. And now, sinkhole routing uh, is a type of traffic dropping, but with the ability to further analyze it. In uh, many cybersecurity operation centers, it's not just enough to identify an attack and drop it. You want to have a look at it. You want to uh, direct, redirect, or save, or make a copy of that traffic in order to analyze it and understand more about the attack, and maybe create some sort of security rule that avoids and drops that traffic if it's identified in the future again. So that's one solution to it. Black hole, just drop everything, or sinkhole, drop it, but also direct it or make a copy of it and store it somewhere safe in order to analyze it later on when the attack has finished. Now, another method for ensuring uh, connection load balancing and uh, resiliency is to have clustering enabled. Now, with traditional load balancing, we're just distributing connections among multiple servers. Well, with clustering, we have multiple devices performing the exact same role. We keep them all completely in sync with one another so that when one of them fails, the other one can immediately take over and start processing the client requests. Now, you might be thinking, isn't that the same thing that we've been doing with load balancing? Well, yes, but with load balancing, all the connections had to go through a load balancer. Well, what if the load balancer fails? You might say, all right, so we're going to get two load balancers in there. So if one of them fails, well, then what? Your clients are supposed to connect to the other load balancer, but how do they know about the other load balancer? How will they know to connect to a different, completely different device when the main one, when the, when the first device fails? So this is what the problem of clustering attempts to solve. So clustering, if we were to redefine it, is a technology that allows us to transparently present to our end users a single IP address, we call that a virtual IP address, even if on the, on the physical side, that virtual IP address might actually point to one, two, three, or, or more identical devices that all belong in a single cluster and they're all synchronized with one another. You might also find the term of floating IP address. And we call it floating IP address because at one point in time, that IP address might point to one device. Later on, when that device might fail, it might point to a different device. But this is completely transparent to the users. They all know that the IP address, that IP address is the one that will answer their requests. 
they don't care which device is behind it or if it's a different device even. Now, of course, we're going to have some protocols that take care of uh, this type of synchronization between those devices so that we can configure them properly in able to have one IP address that points to multiple devices. Basically, we want to educate those devices to know how to behave and how to answer to those requests coming in from on that single virtual IP. Well, that synchronization protocol is also going to take care of who answers which requests, because at the end of the day, even though you might have two load balancers, ready to process your requests if a client sends a single request well that single request is going to reach one of those two load balancers it makes no sense to reach them both all right so the redundancy protocol also has to choose which one of the devices in the cluster is the one that is actively responding to those requests which brings us to a situation where we have to make a difference between active passive clustering and active active clustering well with active passive we have one device that answers all the requests and one or more passive devices just waiting and periodically checking through a heartbeat whether that active device is still up and running and is able to, to serve those clients. And the moment the active device fails, immediately another one of those passive devices takes over the active role. So that's active-passive. Now, on the other hand, we we'll could also have active-active clustering, which is, let's say, real load uh, balancing or load sharing and that is where both or all of the members in the cluster are actively busy serving requests that are coming in now of course if one of them fails then the remaining devices are going to take over the failed ones role and a couple of the protocols worth mentioning here would be carp that's the common address redundancy protocol carp this is also where you will find protocols especially if you have been to some cisco courses uh protocols such as uh, vrrp virtual router redundancy protocol or hsrp hot standby routing protocol or even glbp gateway load balancing protocol they are many but they pretty much work pretty similarly pretty much they do the same thing as in they keep in touch with one another, they keep track of the active cluster members, and they also talk to each other to decide which one of us is going to respond to ARP requests and uh, to the actual uh, application requests coming in onto that virtual IP address. Because we only have one virtual IP address, but we have multiple uh, members in the cluster here that, well, we, we have to talk to each other and <laughs> decide who is the, the one that's going to be responsible for answering those requests. So that's what those protocols are doing. And there's one more thing to mention here. Remember when we said that there's a real problem when it comes to active sessions? That is when a client authenticates themselves and it creates a, a session cookie that it needs to use on every subsequent request. So it makes sense for all those requests to come back to the same server in the back end. Well, clustering attempts to solve this issue as well. Clustering, if implemented at, let's say, firewall level, uh, we have a cluster of firewalls, or at server level, or even at database level, ensures that th that session information is also synced among the multiple members of the cluster. So that the moment one of those members is unable to respond, the other one can, can take over immediately and can even continue from where the other left off because it knows about the same session information. Now, one last topic here to cover. As you probably know, most applications, most networking devices are simply processing the traffic that reaches them on a best effort basis. That is, first come, first serve. If we have resources to process this, uh, this request, this type of traffic, we're going to process it. If we don't, well, tough luck. We're simply going to drop it. We're simply going to ignore it. We're going to let it time out. That's the default behavior if you don't have something uh, like quality of service implemented. So basically, quality of service is a model or a framework for prioritizing certain types of traffic. And when do you need to prioritize traffic? Well, when there's congestion, when there's more traffic than you can handle or when there's more requests than you can handle. Because if you have enough capacity, it makes no sense to prioritize traffic because it's going to reach its intended destination in the same amount of time anyway. So quality of service kicks in the moment when your resources are just not enough. And we have two types of traffic prioritization. First of all, we either might need to ensure a certain amount of bandwidth 
for a specific application. For example, if you have video streaming, we care about the video quality. We want the quality to be high. We want to have good sound, good image. So we need to ensure that was for specific types of traffic. Ideally, the type of traffic that we identified as belonging to video streaming protocols, we're going to allocate a chunk of the bandwidth so that the traffic quality, the video quality is not going to suffer. On the other hand, another type of prioritization that we might want to do is latency. Well, latency is the delay between the packet is sent and the packet is received. Of course, there is always going to be some type of delay, at least a couple of milliseconds between any two points, especially over the internet. But certain applications are more sensitive to delay than others. For example, if you were to send an email and the email arrives within, let's say, five seconds, you consider that email to be a success, right? The connection is good, is okay. I mean, five seconds for an email is okay. But if you're talking on the phone and the other person hears what you just said over five seconds, well, that's not going to be an acceptable type of conversation. So as you can probably guess, uh, the most sensitive to latency are the applications that rely on real-time communication, especially voice-based applications, because the human ear is much more sensitive to delay than the eye is for a bit of delay in the image or uh, a couple of artifacts or image degradation, especially if it's just temporarily. So we need to do three things in order to have quality of service, in order to be able to prioritize the traffic. Uh, first of all, we need to identify the traffic. We need to know what are the rules that say, well, if you're seeing this in the network, then this belongs to Netflix. So if you're seeing this, then this is a voice over IP call. And if you're seeing this, oh, this is BitTorrent. We don't care about that one. Okay, so identification of traffic is the first step. Second, we need marking of traffic. Why do we need to put some sort of a stamp onto that traffic once we've identified? Well, that's because we don't have the two devices, the, the sender and the receiver on the same network. We have a sender and a receiver with the entire internet in between or a VPN in between or a bunch of devices in between. And those devices know nothing about the way we've chosen to identify and to prioritize that specific type of traffic. So if the network that's between the sender and the receiver belongs to us, then in an ideal situation, we could configure those devices and tell them, watch for this type of traffic or watch for a specific label or watch for a specific stamp that's attached to that traffic. And if you're seeing this, apply a specific prioritization policy to it. So we're, we're performing identification and marking as close as possible to the source of the traffic so that everybody else who sees the traffic afterwards up to its destination is going to be able to know what type of traffic that is and how they should handle it. And of course, that traffic handling means applying a specific QoS quality of service policy to it. That is reserving a chunk of bandwidth, uh, maybe jumping the queue so that we minimize the, the latency, minimize the delay, any type of, of policy that ensures that we're actually reaching the level of service that we intend to with this quality of service implementation. So first of all, how do we identify traffic? Well, we just match it using access lists. Well, we could be looking at layer three, layer four, Sometimes it could be looking at layer seven, but that's, uh, that's a special kind of issue in there because sometimes looking at layer seven means assembling the entire data stream and looking in the entire in that entire payload in order to figure out what type of traffic that is. And that type of queuing and traffic assembly and decoding takes time and it might be too late. <laughs> By the time you're done assembling that traffic and figuring out what's inside of it, it might be too late for that traffic to be prioritized. It might be already irreversibly delayed. So in many situations, we prefer to identify the traffic at layer four at most. Now, starting from layer two, and especially with frames that belong to a specific VLAN and they are tagged with the 802.1Q standard, well, the 802.1Q tag format includes information about the VLAN and a couple more information here, including a three bit field, which is called priority code point PCP. Uh, this field also follows the specifications in the IEEE 802.1P, also called class of service. And just like the name says, these are just three bits that when assigned to a specific value, they indicate a specific type of traffic. 
Now you only have eight values, right, ranging from zero through seven, since you only have three bits, but it might be enough at layer two to identify a couple of important traffic types. As you can see here, the standard says that values uh, zero and one are part of background traffic or best effort, so that's the lowest priority, while uh, values such as uh, five, six, or seven, they belong to video voice, network control, internet control, so basically things that make the network work or things that are extremely sensitive to delay and jitter. And by the way, jitter here is the variation of delay or the variation of latency. So one thing to keep in mind here, it's not enough to just mark those frames with these values in there in order for them to be prioritized. You also need a specific QoS policy that takes that value into consideration and applies a specific traffic policy to it. Otherwise, you could be marking packets back and forth all over the internet. Nobody's going to care. So that's what happens at layer two. Remember 802.1p. Now at layer three, we had another implementation called diffserve. Now the way the diffserve protocol is implemented is by leveraging eight bits in the IPv4 header these eight bits right here, which actually are called the DS differentiated services bits. And if you're looking at some older documentation, you might find it listed as, let me see it right here. You might find it listed as TOS, that's the type of service field. So they all refer to the exact same thing. There's eight bits in, uh, in length in there. And those eight bits are divided among six bits that are the DSCP field. That's the differentiated services code point. That's the field that actually uh, describes the prioritization. And two bits for explicit contest and notification. Now, these are not really used anymore. Nowadays, so we're only really going to focus on the DSCP field. Now, the DSCP field, you might think, oh, so we have three bits and uh, in COS, we have six bits now in DSCP more traffic classes. Well, yes, more traffic classes, but unfortunately, really complicated <laughs> in the way they were designed. And uh, the way DSCP was designed was to first define a type of traffic class. And we have four major traffic classes here. Default forwarding, like, well, the traffic that we don't care about, expedited forwarding, things that we need to prioritize, assured forwarding, things that we really need to prioritize, and class selector, that's a simplified version of these classes that are supposed to maintain backwards compatibility with the IP precedence field uh, or the 802.1p field in, uh, in the actual frames where we only had uh, eight classes. Now, among, among these, uh, these default forwarding classes, each and every one of them has multiple subclasses and also different drop probabilities. We have low, medium, and high drop probability. So uh, basically for one single, let's say a short forwarding class one, we would have a short forwarding class one and drop probability of low, which means that it's going to be pretty prioritized, right? If we, <laughs> if we drop down as much as possible, the probability for that packet to be dropped ranging through AF13, right? It's still class one, it's still a short forwarding, but now we have high drop probabilities. So a packet marked with AF13 has a higher chance of being dropped than a packet marked with AF11. But of course, this has to be implemented in a traffic policy as well. Class selector classes, as we said before, there's the simplified uh, version of DSCP, and they also enumerate eight types of classes here, ranging from zero to seven. Uh, their purpose is to map onto the older ones that we saw in the layer two frame, 802.1p classes. So pretty complicated here, actually. You don't really need to go into all that detail, at least not for the Security Plus or for the Network Plus. If you're going for CC and PCC, IE, well, that's going to be a different discussion. Uh, but for now, just remember that DSCP applies uh, to layer three. It's a field of six bits within the IPv4 header, and that field can be used for marking packets in order for those packets to be prioritized later on on the line uh, until their final destination. Speaking of prioritization, let's assume that your traffic has been identified, has been marked, and it has reached at some point in the network a router or a layer three device that sees those DHCP markings and has to do something about it and decides that, well, according to my traffic policy, I need to prioritize this type of traffic. How can I do this? What does this prioritization actually mean? Well, it could mean, for example, to implement a specific queue 
of packets. And I'm only going to put that uh, packets in that queue if they belong to some high priority. And of course, whenever I choose a packet to take from one of my queues and place it onto the wire on the interface, I'm going to make sure that I take packets from the priority queue before I take packets from other queues. Now, that those queues, those packet queues, is basically uh, are going to eat up memory. So they're going to be limited, which means that you can perform this type of queuing only up to a point. If you run out of memory to queue those packets, well, QoS is not going to help you because you simply cannot store nor send those packets anymore. You don't have enough resources to do so. So we have a number of algorithms here that decide how to build and how to take packets out of these, these queues. We could rely on a single priority queue. We could rely on multiple queues according to each traffic class. Uh, we could rely to some uh, weighted distribution of traffic classes uh, or even weighted distribution according to the amount of traffic that an application is generating. Uh, we, there are even uh, algorithms out there that tend to prefer applications that send fewer traffics and prioritize those instead of traffics that eat up a bunch of bandwidth. Because it is assumed that if an application generates a low amount of traffic, well, that, that traffic is probably critical. Uh, if, you're lo if you lose that traffic, you lose a bunch of the functionality behind that application. While an application that generates a lot of traffic, well, it might have some built-in mechanisms to retransmit those packets. So we might be safe if we just drop some of that that huge amount of traffic right i, I read this comparison uh when when reading about qos a couple of years ago in a cisco book that said when if you're if you're in a let's say in a meeting room and a lot of people are talking and a few of the people are just hogging the discussion and only only they're talking in there nobody else uh, has a chance to say anything if one single person who has never said anything before starts speaking suddenly and only says like a couple of words, everybody's going to listen to him, right? Because that silent person, when they had something to say, it's probably important. That's the same um, behavior that is found inside QoS as well. If we have a traffic that sends just a couple of bytes every couple of minutes, well, that traffic might be important enough to prioritize it on top of an application that generates 100 megabytes per second. All right, so how do these policy enforcements actually work? Well, we have your traffic identified, we have it marked, we have it queued. What do we do now? Well, what do we do with that, with that queued traffic? Well, if it's a priority queue, uh, obviously we're gonna try to send it as soon as possible. If it's not a priority queue, what do we do with traffic that is uh, second class, right? <laughs> traffic that we, we've chosen to sacrifice in order to better serve the priority applications. Well, we have two methods of dealing with traffic that is low priority. First of all, we could be doing shaping. Uh, shaping means we're uh, simply going to queue up traffic and allow it to leave the network interface up to a specific speed. So we're, let's say we're limiting Netflix up to one megabit per second. If you're content with that, if your users can handle that image quality, fine by us, we don't really care. But what's important to us is that whenever there's congestion, we don't want Netflix to be the application that's eating up all the network bandwidth. So that's shaping. We're queuing up as many packets as possible and then sending them at a steady rate. Okay, that's shaping. Well, queuing takes memory, as I said, and all the resources in this world are limited, memory included. So what happens when even those packet queues get full? Well. There's only one thing to do. You just start dropping traffic. We call this traffic policing. So instead of just queuing traffic and nicely trying to shape the traffic to match a specific flow, specific bandwidth, we're just dropping all the packets, blindly dropping all the packets that go above a certain threshold. So if we allow one megabit per second for Netflix, if somebody tries to watch Netflix at 10 megabits per second, we're simply going to drop everything above one megabit. Of course, it's going to be a lot of lost traffic in there. Uh, TCP is going to go crazy. The uh, sliding windows are going to half, and a lot of retransmissions are going to happen. But most applications, especially TCP applications, are going to start playing nicely. So they're going to level themselves down. They're going to level their sliding windows down to match the available bandwidth. 
So it's kind of like the, the police enforcing order so that people are kept in line. So we're dropping the traffic and we expect the applications to figure out, oh, so that's how much bandwidth am I allowed to use? Let me just dial down the traffic just a bit in order to avoid as much as possible too many lost packets and too many tree transmissions. So long story short, shaping queue packets and send them nicely out at a steady rate, policing, still send packets at a steady rate, but drop everything in excess. And well, since we're in a security training, what about attacks that target a QoS infrastructure? Well, if you think about it, can somebody fake the markings on your traffic? Can somebody introduce fake DSC or 802.1p values in your, in your frames? Of course they can. Of course they can. And that's actually called a fake urgency attack. That is when you're faking the fact that the traffic belongs to a priority class. There's not much that you can do against this type of an attack, especially because it requires the attacker to belong to your network and be able to intercept the traffic. Now, fake urgency is a term that is coined in the uh, social engineering aspect of security, but we can apply this to QoS as well. Now, there aren't really many ways of protecting yourself against fake urgency because once you're inside of the perimeter of the network, most security solutions will consider that type of traffic, especially if it, has, if it has already gone through these security devices, through the firewalls, it has been identified and it has been marked for a specific type of priority. Most likely it was already deemed as valid traffic and acceptable traffic and safe traffic. So if somebody manages to intercept it and alter it even further, well, there's probably not much more than you can do about it. Now, the good news about this is that, well, faking QoS on, on packets isn't really that damaging to your network, apart from a situation where it results in a denial of service attack, as in the attacker prioritizes their own fake traffic so that everybody else is being denied access to network resources. But let's just hope that it's too difficult to implement to ever find yourself in this situation. Now, just for just for fun, let me just show you how easy it is to launch a denial of service attack. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to attack this virtual machine that you're he seeing right here uh, on the screen. Now, it's a very lightweight virtual machine, only has one single virtual CPU with four gigabytes of RAM. So it's not going to take a lot to bring it down. Uh, but the tool I'm going to use, and by the way, there are more tools than you and I can count uh, that you can use to perform denial of service attack or sin floods. You can even use traditional networking tools such as HPing to do this. But what I'm going to show you here is this kind of funny tool, little tool right here called the Low Orbit Ion Cannon Loic. Now, unfortunately, I cannot increase the size of this window more than it uh, actually is. I hope you can read what's happening in here. Now, but nevertheless, what's important is that you can see it's a painfully simple interface. I'm only required to provide the IP address of the victim that I'm planning to attack. And if I open a CMD prompter in here and ipconfig uh, is going to tell me that my current IPv4 address in this virtual machine is 10.10.10.134. So that's the exact IP address that I've locked onto right here. You can see this big IP address in the middle of the screen. You can also choose a specific method, TCP, UDP method based on HTTP. You can also set some param parameters in here, like the number of threads uh, that you'll be using, uh, on which port is the attack going to be conducted on, how fast it's supposed to go, and so on and so forth. You can just leave them all at their default. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to click this big button right here <laughs> that says, I sincerely hope you can guess what this button does. That's the <laughs> that's the hint that shows up here. The button says, I'm charging the laser. So I'll, I'll just ignore how this, this interface was designed. But let me show you this. I'm going to click on this button right here. You can see the number of requests starts increasing here at the bottom. Even if you cannot read this, trust me, that's a huge number here. It's already in the tens of millions. It has already sent that many requests so far. And it might be that the recording is starting to suffer as well. Let me just try to launch a test manager here to see what's going on in the background. And we actually have to wait for the task manager to load. <laughs> <laughs> so, apparently we, we've managed to bring down this virtual machine with just the press of a button. So you can see the CPU is at 100% load. 
Ethernet, the network interface, is already almost 200 megabits per second of flood traffic. You can see the CPU, it's stuck at 100%. Uh, right now, there's not much you can do with this virtual machine. If I were to launch just a couple more threads or the same application from a different computer, that's like two sources, that's it, the distributed denial of service using this, just two sources, that would probably make this virtual machine completely unusable. It's that, that easy, all right? Now, I'm going to stop the, uh, I'm going to stop the flooding here. And uh, the virtual machine is going to take a while to recover. As you can see, it already started dropping the, uh, uh, the CPU load. But if you're looking here under the processes, it's still, it still takes a lot to process the request that it already received in the queues that's under system interrupts right here. So it's still going <laughs> to last for a while, even though I just chose to, uh, to stop the flood right here where the, uh, where the load dropped, right? So it's, it's that easy, right? To, to, to conduct a denial of service attack. All right, so that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and I know this has been a pretty networking and intensive <laughs> chapter, but I hope you found it interesting and informative. Now, if you like this, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, support the channel if you wish. I don't need to tell you this every single time, right? <laughs> so thanks for watching and see you on the next video. Bye-bye.